All right, Matthew, welcome to episode 67 of the Performers Advantage podcast with myself, Dr. Will O'Connor, and Dr. Matt Miller, sport scientist. We specialize in bringing sports science to the people. Dr. Matt Miller is a world leader in MTB research and inventor of Brakecase, the brake sensor for analyzing braking within mountain biking, utilizing disc brakes and strain gauges and a whole bunch of other complex stuff. He has a lifetime of MTB racing experience, including UCI and EWS World Series. He works with rad riders from all around the world and is the founder of Smart MTB Training. Dr. Will O'Connor is an elite ultramarathon runner and professional coach. He brings across his expert knowledge in ketogenic performance nutrition, elite triathlon experience, and is also a Training Peaks coach educator. Not to mention my friend and the anchor of this podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. All right. I'm super excited to have Guillaume Malay on the show because fatigue is something I have been fascinated with ever since I read about Tim Noakes' Central Governor theory that is how and why we slow down you can think it's because you can't go any further and your body's telling you no more but maybe it's your mind and maybe it's not your mind maybe it's something in the sphere that suggests that you need to slow down to avoid catastrophic failure if you've ever wondered why you slow down this is going to be a great interview just for you. I was just looking at um, Dr. Guillaume's research gate profile, which is where scientists store all their research. It's like a Facebook for researchers. It's super cool. You should check it out. But he has, I think, 334 research items, which is a lot. That is a lot of published papers, a lot of presentations. That's just a lot of information. So this is going to be a really great episode, kind of picking his brain about fatigue and um, get maybe some of his thoughts on some of the things that we've never really thought about from a real expert in the field. Yeah, so to take from Guillaume's own kind of profile on this research social media, he states that fatigue is one of the most common and distressing symptoms experienced by athletes and patients. We study extreme sports, ultra endurance or hypoxia as a model to explore limits of human adaptive responses. In patients, we aim to develop an accurate measure of fatigue that uses central motor cortical and motor neural excitability and peripheral markers of neuromuscular function, as well as biochemical biomarkers and sleep quality indices to investigate the etiology of fatigue. That's pretty full on. That is pretty full on. I think this is going to be really good and we'll get, um, get it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and... We're going to make it really relevant for you. So this is going to be a good episode. All right, Guillaume, welcome to the show. So you're currently in France and really just want to get a bit of a, a background on you. Um, you've got 334 publications as according to the research social media of of research gate so we what I don't, th I don't think that's that many it's uh, <laughs> i think it's a bit more than 200 uh, official papers i would say that's still that's still a lot of papers actually that's that's um many years of papers isn't it yeah, too many are you saying that i'm old <laughs> well <laughs> I, I guess we're like so how long have you been researching because that, that you don't um, just get 200 papers over overnight I, I, I graduated from my PhD in 97, so I guess 20, 25 or so. That's a pretty wow. good track record. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of um, absorbing critical reviews <laughs> from reviewers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. Uh, so the French pretty much dominated the mountain bike world championships that just happened. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I'm not an expert as you are, but uh, actually the the guy Jordan uh, Saru, yeah, he live uh, like uh, 50k from where I live. Oh, amazing! I don't oh, amazing. I, I don't know him personally. Actually, I didn't I didn't know I don't, didn't even know the name. But uh, yeah, apparently he's from my region. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. They had such dominant performances. It was it was so fun to watch on on TV. Um, it's yeah. sometimes a bit uh, weird, right? When you have a nation dominating everything. Uh, I hope this is not doping, but uh, hopefully not. <laughs> but they, um, you know, Pauline won the cross country and then 
and then all the way through to the um, downhill. So, I mean, yeah, unless I've got a, I, a stringent... I remember, for instance, uh, a, a cross country skiing um, uh, Austria. So, Austria has never been um, a leading country in cross country skiing. And, and one day, all of a the sudden, they, they started to dominate everything and it, it lasted a year. And then uh, we figured out that there was actually a huge uh, doping system. So <laughs> That's, they, uh, is that the Elder Glass? Yeah. Sorry? Is that the Elder Glass? Was that the, um, the, the kind of system that they broke? Was that the investigation? that they were running? Um, I, I can't remember. That was many years ago. That was at least uh, 15 years ago. So oh, well, there was that one just recently that. where the, um, on, there's that video that came out, you know, and that guy had the needle, the blood bag, and, and the infusion, like, in, in his arm. In, in Austria? Was it in Austria? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I, I'm not sure if they were, it was an Austrian athlete. I'm not sure if they were in Austria. It's a cross-country skier. Hopefully the French are clean. Yeah. Hopefully things have changed i hope so i'm not so sure but i hope so <laughs> Guillaume, do you i see with your uh title there do you just go by gi is that is that how you say it i'm not yeah, gi is fine yeah gi it's, it's uh, up to you you can say both <laughs> actually you pronounce Guillaume pretty well because they're usually a, a native english speaker they have trouble with uh Guillaume pronunciation it's like Guillaume. <laughs> but well, uh, the way you pronounced it was, was, was good actually <laughs> uh, my, my wife speaks French she rode okay, as a professional okay, okay. cyclist in France for a few years so I got, I got nice. her to double check uh, it's also the French um, version of William so. exactly. did you start off um, what we, we really want to talk to you about is, is the flush model uh, which we'll get into but in your background a, a lot of what you've done um, is around the neuromuscular fatigue and, and fatigue in general. Is that where you started off? Was that the, the interest point for you entering into research? I would say that the initial interest was really integrative exercise physiology uh, and more particularly the, the energy cost of locomotion, so cross-country skiing, running. And that was uh, my uh, PhD topic was about uh, running economy and cross-country skiing efficiency. Uh, including both physiology and a bit of uh, biomechanics. And then, uh, yeah, um, soon enough after my, uh, uh, when I got my first position, I started to, to work uh, more specifically on fatigue. And uh, yeah, since then, meaning for the last 20 years, I've been working on fatigue. Yeah, that's right. Wow. So you generally, the way it, the way it goes is you follow your, your, your passions or your sporting passions. So have you been uh, a runner, a cross-country skier yourself? Yes, I've been doing, um, well, first cross-country skiing, then uh, adventure races. And I know you're very familiar with that in New Zealand. Um, and then uh, trail running and ultra trail running, actually. Uh, so I've been, uh, yeah, my sport is definitely, uh, I would say, endurance sports in general. Uh, I have uh, I had a biopsy uh, one time and I had uh, eighty six percent type one fibers in my quadriceps, so I'm definitely a slow a slow guy, <laughs> uh, and that's why I was uh, enjoying so much endurance sports and 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 I guess the longer the the better for me. So ultra trail was was perfect uh, at the end. But I've I haven't done any competition for the last ten years, but uh, I've been doing competitions for almost thirty years. I would say almost nonstop. Yeah. So what kind of uh, adventure racing? Because if I'm thinking back to the early 2000s, you know, there was a, a pretty major series um, with the, uh, what was the, Sal the world? Sal Salomon. The, the Salomon series? Yes. Yeah. I think, yeah, at least in Europe, that was, uh, yeah, the the cross, uh, cross series, I think it was called, uh, organized by Salomon. Yes, I did that one. That was exactly at that time, uh, uh, end of 2000. I mean, in, in the, no, sorry, early 2000. I wonder if endurance, uh, ultra endurance sports really kind of peaked around the early 2000s. Because if I think about mountain biking in the early 2000s, that was when 24 hour racing was really popular. Like, uh, I guess what I'm thinking is it peaked definitely in the early 2000s. And then after maybe like 2007, 2008, it's not, not as popular, but definitely like in the early 2000s. Like if you okay, weren't doing 24 hour races, like you weren't racing. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> that was the, it was the same for, um, like Ironman triathlon as well. 
it just absolutely exploded in the the late 90s and early 2000s as well as when triathlon got absorbed into the olympics so there's a few other points there but maybe just I, I endurance did, sports. I, I did ironman one day uh just once uh in france uh i know if you know the ironman triathlon ironman triathlon it's uh, ah it's yes a, it's a, yeah yeah it's a tough one with the the col de l'isoa which is a famous pass uh that uh, they use uh they, they use often for the for the tour de france and uh, so yeah, uh, but I'm I'm not such a good swimmer, so you know, triathlon was not for me. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you there. Yeah, that was my my same problem as the swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done any any mountain biking? Um, not so much. A bit. Uh, there is a, actually a famous race in Switzerland called the uh, Verbier Grimmens. I don't know if you know that one. It's uh, it's quite famous. Lots of uh, bikers. And I did it once without any preparation. Uh, I was it was tough. Uh, I mean, it's not <laughs> as hard as a UTMB, for instance. But uh, because my preparation was so bad, that was probably one of my worst experiences. <laughs> <laughs> That's a guaranteed way to make it like worse than it should be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that actually. So, uh, I yeah, I realized that, that training training was important. <laughs> Reminds me of my first um, my first trail running. It was it was a it was an adventure race, but we were doing it as a team. And um, yeah, I, we, you think just because you're fit, you know, you can you can accomplish, you can wing it, you know, and to, and you'll just be oh, I'm fit enough, I'll, I'll get through it. But man, the specifics of some of those things is really demanding. So Guillaume, I'm curious because um, you said you finished your PhD in 1997, and then you were competing in these ultra races. Do you think um, you took forward like any of the science that you were practicing to your competitions and like bring some of your competitions into your science and that's how you carried on with towards your fatigue research? Is that kind of how it happened? Yeah, actually, more or less. Uh, I would say the, the second option is probably the, the, the valid one. Um, I think the, my uh, career uh, as a runner uh, helped me more for my science than the other way around <laughs> uh, and actually the at least at the beginning one of the reason i started to, to study fatigue and, and extreme fatigue was uh, because i was interested in uh, ultra endurance sports of course so it was a uh, kind of a fun so let's do it and there wasn't much at that time and then i realized that it was super interesting and it was actually a very good model to to study extreme fatigue and to study the, the limit the limits of uh, human beings so um and then yeah and then the other way around it, it worked uh as well but uh um my my work has never been uh, dedicated to to performance or more recently i would say uh, or to to a given extent it was more like the understanding of fatigue uh, understanding the central and peripheral component that, so there was no at least not purposely any any clear uh will to to do applied applied science even so i published a couple of papers on, on performance but that was not my main goal i would say okay there, there was something in there that you said that probably most people won't have heard of and you said extreme fatigue so when you say extreme fatigue what do you what do you mean by that is that different than our normal fatigue that we might feel extreme fatigue is uh maybe this is not a, a good word in my uh, mind extreme fatigue means extreme fatigue for extreme duration exercise but of course you can have extreme fatigue if you consider the definition of fatigue which is a, a reduction of uh, functional capacity a reduction of maximum strength you can have extreme fatigue by doing a two minute uh, sustained mvc maximum voluntary contraction so this is this is also extreme fatigue because you can you can lose like 50 percent of your maximum strength so this is extreme fatigue but this is obviously not what i call extreme fatigue i'm talking about uh, uh, fatigue that you experience when you do those ultra uh, endurance. So if you really try to push yourself for many, many hours, uh, that's what I call extreme fatigue. Kind of set the scene, I guess, for your your model. Uh, what, if you if you had to or could summarize fatigue for, we'll we'll say endurance sports. So things um, most of our our listeners are going to be exercising for at least 30 minutes you know at least a, a 10 10k run um or you know 10 mile time trial or something on the bike or something like that and all the way out to 
a couple of days or something like that. But if we, if we have a look at kind of the main aspects of fatigue, what's, what's your thoughts or summary or opinions on, on what's slowing us down? A tough question, <laughs> large question, yeah. I would say. It is, it is. <laughs> um, I, yeah, as I said, uh, I guess the general definition of fatigue and that applies to, to any type of exercise is, uh, both reduction of uh, functional capacity. Uh, so, and one thing we have been working on recently is, uh, so how, how do you, uh, objective, how do you, um, measure that? Is it just uh, isometric contraction as most people do? Or if you measure maximal power reference and does it give you the same, the same outcome? And the answer is no, actually. Anyway, so a reduction in, in uh, functional capacity is one thing. And the other, I guess, definition of fatigue is, uh, the, an increase of the cost of your exercise of running or cycling, meaning that for the, the same speed, the same power output, uh, you need more uh, energy. So there's a reduction of efficiency and you need, and it also uh, increases your uh, rating of perceived exertion. So this increase of, uh, and they are not necessarily associated, but they can. So this increase of uh, energy or or psychological cost, if you if you wish, uh, is I would say the second definition of fatigue, um, and this, that's actually the the reason why I uh, I uh, I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the the flush model, I created the flush model because uh, my first um, papers on, on on fatigue were, were definitely on only about neuromuscular fatigue, and I'm still working on that. Uh, even so now it's more with patients than athletes, well, actually I do both, but uh, more and more with, with uh, in the clinical side. But with uh, at the beginning of my career, it was mainly with uh, with either um, uh, PZ students or, or athletes, and particularly runners or skiers. And, um, and I realized that, okay, so this is interesting to study neuromuscular fatigue, but uh, as a runner, uh, since we're talking about the relationship between the scientists and the, and the athletes, as a runner, it didn't help much. Actually, it, it helped, but uh, it definitely couldn't explain everything. So I was like, okay, so yeah, you need to to consider the, the psychological aspects. So you need to have uh, what I would call the holistic approach. And that's why I created the flush model. Uh, it's based on neuromuscular fatigue, but it's much more than neuromuscular fatigue. And for those who um, aren't super up to uh, like the scientific terms, like neuromuscular, are you talking about the the recruitment pathway from, I guess, your your brain to to your muscles? Yes, exactly. So neuromuscular. So there is obviously the neural part and the muscle part, uh, and this is basically the same thing as saying the central versus peripheral fatigue. So peripheral is the muscle, central is not only the brain, it's the, the nervous system uh, in general. And uh, yeah, if you're, if you're not uh, familiar with, with fatigue or with physiology, you may consider that, okay, I'm fatigued, this is normal because I produce lactic acid or I have muscle damage, that kind of thing. And, and of course that happens. Uh, muscle definitely can fatigue. Uh, but uh, we know that this is much more than muscle fatigue. This is really neuromuscular fatigue because the system, uh, the nervous system plays a major role in fatigue and actually particularly in endurance sports. And the, the longer uh, the exercise and the, the more important is the role of the, the nervous system. That's right. And this is where we get into the, the flush model. And how I came across you and, and the flush model and your work was I was trying to find information on pacing strategies for 24 hour running so i have a 24 hour run in um, a little over a month now and the, the, i really couldn't find specific information or research that sort of suggests this is how much you're going to slow down or this is why you might be slowing down and then i came and i came across your your flush model which was just really hit a light bulb in my head around, wow, someone's actually looked at more of a reason outside of your muscles are sore. Of course, they're going to be sore. Of course, you're going to run out of, um, you know, resources, I guess, if we're talking peripherally and you, you're going to slow down. But what's the other component of that? We all know 
that there's a mental aspect of that. And you kind of coupled those together into the flush model and, and that's where I I would love for you to, to get into get into that. Yeah. Uh yeah, as I just said, and I think you, you summarized it very well. Um and this is uh what I just said that uh yeah if you consider only the physiological aspect uh which is still the, the basis and of course uh uh, you cannot say that everything is in the mind. It, it doesn't make any sense, of course. We, we know that in the end, the brain is going to decide whether or not you have to slow down or not. Uh, because at any time of your 24 hours run, you can, you can sprint. So obviously this is, this is your call. This is your, your brain decision to, to speed up or to slow down. But, uh, of course, the decision are made based on what the, the body is feeling. So, of course, this is a combination of both, and that's why we needed a model such as the, the flush model. And, and this is uh, obviously not the first model that integrated these aspects. Uh, and the, the first person to do that, as, as you know, was a uh, team notes. Uh, so team notes was the first one to, to, to really, uh, discuss the possibility that, um, that the brain is uh, eventually deciding. Um, and, uh, another researcher is much less known, at least in this field is Ben Kaiser, uh, a, a Swiss guy, actually a Dutch guy who is working in Switzerland, who uh, wrote a paper in 2003, I think, uh, in European Journal of Applied Physiology saying that exercise, uh, starts and finishes in the brain. And that's, uh, yeah, the, the, the flush model was, uh, built based on those, uh, uh previous, uh, models, I would say. But uh, the flush model, I would say is more, um comprehensive uh, and probably more uh, specific to endurance and ultra endurance sports and i think it's actually more also more fun <laughs> I, I of course i one of the reason I, I did this model is was also for fun not not only for fun but uh, it was also for fun because i love the idea of uh, working on the on the fresh oil so so when we will and i have this debate that um, it's around mental toughness. And um, we, we always kind of talk about because we always like to talk about pacing because I like to study pacing models. And um, there's kind of this thought out there, especially amongst competitors, that mental toughness is, wins a race. And we're, talk, we're not talking like a, a, an ultra endurance. We're talking just like a normal kind of race that the reason someone can go so hard is because they're mentally tougher. And we, we hear that a lot. And I don't, I don't really buy into that part because when we have someone exercising and we see them fatiguing, we can actually measure, we can measure what's happening in their body and see when they surpass a certain limit. And, you know, when they exceed the lactate threshold and we know their time is limited exercising above the lactate threshold. But, um, you, it really hurts. And people think that, well, if I, can push beyond that it's because I'm mentally tough. So I'm pretty sure though, like when we talk about mental toughness and the flush model, those are not related things. Is that right? Uh, no, they are actually. They are uh, related. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> so the, the model, um, and I guess the, the people, uh, listening this, uh, this podcast, uh, will be able to find information about the model on, on online but uh, the model has four components so the first one so of course it's a it's a flush toilet so in the in the flush toilet you have a bowcock and this is actually uh, so of course uh, depending the, the the level of uh, water in the tank and this is actually the the rating of perceived exertion okay so this can increase or decrease if you exercise uh, and if you or if you rest uh, then the second component is the how fast the, the level of water is increasing. So the second component is the filling rate. Uh, of course, in a flush toilet, you have a waste pipe. So that's the third component. And the fourth component is actually what you're talking about. This is a security reserve. Um, so this security reserve uh, in a normal flush toilet is, of course, here to uh, to uh, um, to not have the water uh, overfilling. Uh, and this, this security reserve, uh, in, in a runner or in a, in, in an athlete is here to prevent physiological damage. And, and, uh, the security reserve, uh, of course, one of the thing you can say there is a security reserve is that even if you push as hard as, if you push, sorry, as hard as possible, 
you will never die from from running or if you die there is another reason and there is myocardial inf uh, infection or, or heat uh, uh, heat stress or something like that but it's not really from exercise right so there is a security reserve and mental toughness is a way to reduce security reserve and if you can minimize this security reserve because you're tough or and I don't think that's only because you're tough. You can also work on that. So mental preparation is, of course, a way to to uh, both minimize the feeling rates and maybe tolerate more pain. And if you are able to tolerate more pain, and this is, I guess, the definition of, of, of uh, mental toughness, you are actually reducing the security reserve. So no, this is definitely related. But of course, the, the model is here to show that it's not only about the security reserve. It's it's one part of the model but uh, the, probably the best way to 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 improve performance is to minimize the feeling rate of water and to do that of course the best way is to train because yeah if you if you train for a given intensity the RPE will increase much slower as we know All right so if we just um clarify that obviously you uh like you can visualize it and picture it in your head and we're, we're audio so we've got the you got the toilet and it's the ball cock in the toilet that controls the the filling rate pretty much like a well it, but no, it doesn't control it no it, it uh, feels the feeling feels rate. Yeah, yeah yeah and the water's coming in and and that dictates your well represents your rpe rating of perceived exertion so if it's yes. super low it's one out of 16 or 20 or whatever model you're using yeah. and you think yeah that's that's all good and if we have the filling rate uh, really low that would be something like walking and then exactly. go to the filling rate of like the open tap and that is an all-out sprint and now the the filling rate's super high but you also have the the means of dumping some of that water out flushing the toilet which yeah. is as I understand it, um, as I was explaining it to Matt, there is the, your mental capacity to withstand whatever demands are being um, thrown at you through your, your, your physical task. Then there's also uh, the peripheral um, resource maintenance or system control, so buffering lactic acid, supplying nutrients, mm -hmm. dissipating heat, that's how I saw it. And then you've got the, the ceiling at which the water will overflow. And at that point, that's kind of your shutoff mechanism at which you faint or stop or disengage from the task or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty, pretty cool uh, description of the model, I, I guess. <laughs> and there, there are actually other, other, um, and I would say that the, the model can almost explain or hopefully explain all the literature about uh, determining factor of performance in endurance and ultra endurance sport. Uh, let's talk, for instance, about the, the mental fatigue. So mental fatigue, and even so, I saw uh, yesterday a tweet about uh, the fact that maybe mental fatigue is not that uh, negative for, for performance. But anyway, so there, there, are, uh, there are many papers showing that uh, there is a, a negative effect on performance. So if you are mentally fatigued before a race, um, there, there is a reduction of performance. And in the model, it is the same thing as starting the race with already some water in. Okay, so that's, uh, that's why the, 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 the flush model, I think, works well. That this is a good example because sometimes you start when you haven't slept enough, for instance, or if you are, if you have issue in your life or whatever, you start the race and the RP is not as low as it should be at the beginning. So it means that there is already some water. And of course, that's not good for, for, for performance because you're reaching your security reserve faster than if you start with an empty tank. So it's like uh, automatically your capacity is reduced. So the performance is reduced. The capacity, are, the physical capacity and physiological capacities are still there. But since you start with a higher level, a higher RP, you stop early. Okay, okay, cool. Sleep deprivation, I think, is another very good example. Because sleep sleep deprivation actually doesn't affect your VO2 max or your lactate threshold or, or your, your strength. It affects your RPE. So that's 
one of the reasons why if you are sleep deprived, of course, to a given extent, because if you don't sleep for three nights, everything will be deteriorated. But uh, if you have like one night of sleep deprivation, the, the performance in uh, explosive or intense exercise won't be uh, decreased that much, but the endurance, the, the prolonged performance will be, will be uh, reduced. And this is related to RPE. So again, this is starting with some water in the tank. Would it lower the security reserve? Um, I don't, I don't want to kind of shoot off uh, on a tangent here, but as far as I understand the work of Samuel Makora, who is kind of another, you know, Tim Noakes iconic kind of figure within mm-hmm. fatigue. Um, and he talks about the, the task disengagement um, at which kind of something becomes so hard or perceived to be too hard for you to continue. So if, um, you know, Matt doesn't really care about running, so he's going to run until he's not enjoying it anymore and then you'll just stop. Whereas I'm super dedicated to my training and performance and I'm going to push, push, push. And so just the buy-in of Matt is just not going to be be the same. Now, and then you can all go th- like further on and say, if I give you a million dollars, can you keep running or can you keep biking or can you do another sprint? And you probably can. So the, the motivation and, and what's driving that, um, you to continue or you to disengage from that task is... Is, is clearly motivationally based. How does that fit into to your model? Well, again, this is the security reserve. So if you are more motivated, you are going to reduce the security reserve. So you 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 can definitely, yeah. If you do a let's say you do a, an experiment in the lab, I ask you to do an experiment in the lab, and and you're you're nice, so you do that for me, uh, <laughs> and then and and you push, and uh, and I'm asking you to do a temperature exhaustion, and you will push. Uh, to a given extent, and then at some point you will say, "Okay, Guy is nice, but I'm I have enough. I I don't want to do more for him." Uh, and you will stop. And now, if I like the, immediately before you stop, as you said, if I tell you, "Okay, so this is now one thousand dollars," if you if you if you do another minute, would you do it? Yes. So you are going to in- reduce your security reserve again. And then at some point, the money won't be enough. So maybe if you're in, a, in an Olympic final, then you will be able to reduce again your security reserve. And even then the question is, okay, let's assume that we are in an Olympic final at the end of the, the last, uh, so the end spurt of uh, 10,000 meters. And the guys, they are, they are of course, uh, you cannot, I guess you cannot be more motivated than that, right? But now imagine that there is a lion um, launch uh, behind them. The, um, I don't know, but maybe they can. And most people, maybe the Olympic final, they won't be able to, to speed up. But most people, even so, they, they are in a the race. They're, they are telling you that, no, I'm, I cannot be more motivated. And then if their life is in danger, don't you think they will find the resource to, 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 to speed up? Probably, yes. So most people will. So there is definitely this. And this shows that the, the, the mental in the end is deciding because, yeah, you decide to stop. And the rate is that you can almost always do more at least for the for the endurance endurance sport so this is a, one of the reasons probably why people are saying yeah this is uh, all in the mind and the uh, mental toughness is very important because yeah this is true it is important but again this is only for the for the the security reserve and and this is not all about performance because the, the as, as i said the, the main way to to improve performance is to make sure that you are not reaching this this limit um or you're reaching this limit the, as late as possible. So that's so, where you your side of things comes into it, Matt. Yeah, so Will and I actually would talk about that same exact scenario where we're in the Olympics and there's these athletes, they've all prepared their whole lives for this one moment. And Will was kind of arguing that it, it's mental at that point. And as you were saying that, I was thinking about when we talked about that because my argument was, well, I... I don't think it's mental. But now as as we kind of like bring in the model, I'm thinking, okay, so I mean, is it possible that everyone um, could, like your competitors that you're racing against, could all have a security reserve that is equally small? I, I, I don't know. And I don't think anybody will be able to tell that one day. Uh, but, but I think there are differences at this level as there are differences as other levels. 
uh, and I think some people are really able to hurt themselves much more than others. And of course, you 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 can't tell from from people from seeing people, but uh, because maybe some athletes are just good actors, but uh, you you can tell that some athletes are are very very uh, bad at the end of the race. Uh, I remember someone like um, uh, Ashik and the, the Norwegian Bjorn Deli, the Norwegian skier. Um, so watch watch uh, his races again, and you will see that at the end he was he was devastated <laughs> by by the by the pain and there are and and i guess if you are an elite athlete you have to to to, to suffer you have to to be able to to tolerate the pain uh, but i don't think they are all equal uh, and i and i think there is actually a genetic component so we we are not even 100 percent sure that uh, this is something that you can train we can think so we can think that the more experience you have with pain that you're uh, the the more you're able to tolerate the pain, but this is not even uh, certain. The, the only way to do that will be to to measure actually uh, neuromuscular fatigue at the end of the race, like right at the the finish line. And uh, if you are able to minimize the security reserve, if you have if you increase your mental toughness, this should be visible by increasing fatigue. So in the end, so the the goal is not to is both to minimize fatigue during the race. So basically, uh, because if you do that, you are going to to reduce the feeling rates. But in the end, you may you want to have the highest possible fatigue, of course, because you want to push to your limit. But uh, of course, this is not something we can do. We cannot measure the neurological fatigue. I'll, I'll try to do that one day, but uh, I don't think people will let me do that uh, in the stadium, measuring fatigue at the end of a ten thousand meter race. Oh man, there's be no way to answer that through ethics. <laughs> it's bad enough just when you, you know, Matt, the amount of studies we've done and when someone goes, all right, now, now just, now just put the, you know, get the gas analysis or, or can I just take a, a venipuncture? Um, oh, I just need to get your lactate from, you know, like, leaving me alone. <laughs> can I have a muscle biopsy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we kind of, that's, that's the top, that's the tippy top end in, in terms of the security reserve. What about someone? I'm thinking. Let's let's say a, a one a one hour one hour time trial. Um, this is actually pretty topical. There's a, a a local runner, a New Zealand runner, went for the one hour running record uh, just on on the weekend. Now, is it possible for someone to um, sustain or be able to maintain a higher RPE? for a long duration like that do you believe um you know can can someone if we just uh for the ease of of use just say out of 10 could someone maintain an eight out of 10 discomfort level versus a seven or do you think that your kind of model is only in terms of the security reserve only applies to like the top end like the end um, spurt? I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> um, again, I guess it's a question of motivation, uh, but uh, I don't think, uh, uh, even so they are uh, cycling at the same speed, more or less uh, during the whole uh, hour, I don't think the RP is 18 too soon. I mean, if, if it was 18 from the beginning, they, I don't think they will be able to, to finish uh, at the same pace. So I think the even so the, the pace is the is pretty constant. The AP is increasing uh, throughout the the hour um, for for different reasons. But uh, so one is of course the, the the feedback receiving from the muscle. So if you uh, keep uh, accumulating uh, protons or or uh, other byproducts, uh, the, the feedback will inform your system, nervous system that this is getting harder. And then if you if you fatigue, uh, and it could be muscle fatigue or even uh, fatigue at the spinal level, at the motor neuron level, you need to, to recruit more motor units, more muscle mass to, to, to cycle to, to cycle at the same pace. And you have this, uh, and this is a Makora's model, you have this uh, efferent copy from your motor cortex to your sensory cortex. And this is, this also reinforces or increases your, your uh, RP. 
So I think for both reasons, feed, this is what we call feedback and feed forward mechanisms. For both reasons, I think your RP is gradually increased. And um, the goal is actually to, to reach your, your maximal or tolerable level at, at the very end. Because if you, if you do that too early, then you'll have to stop. Uh, and again, there are differences between people. Some people are probably able to, to tolerate a, a high level of RP for a, a long period, but, uh, uh, but still the, 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 the aim is to, to be smart enough to, and that's why the work on critical speed, et cetera, is, is very important because you need to, to decide what is this limit? Because if you go above this limit, uh, then there is this uh, threshold. And we actually just uh, submitted a paper about that showing that, uh, even a very small increase can definitely improve a lot, uh, or not improve, sorry, increase a lot your enormous quality. So this is a, again, a combination of uh, pacing, uh, physiological capacities and mental toughness. We go to, well, my 24 hour race. And you've obviously done uh, events lasting longer than 24 hours and 24 hours and probably something around 12 to 24. Now, that's not a high level per se of, of RPE. You know, that is a, a consistent, mild level of discomfort. And like what what is causing someone at hour 16 of a 24 hour? I guess what two questions in this is, is what is causing someone to slow down and what can they do to maintain their, their output? Because peripherally, if they've paced appropriately, that, you know, they're not going to have um, utilized all of their glycogen stores or um, have an accumulation of protons, um, lactate, uh, acidity in, in any way. So it's kind of this, it's sure there's going to be muscle damage, but really, yeah, what, what can we do? What's slowing these athletes down and what's, what's allowing them to continue? Again, this is a matter of RPE. So you, you know that if you're above a certain level, that is probably individual, you know that you won't be able to tolerate it for the, the rest of the, the race. So let's say you're in the middle of your 24 hours race and you're like, okay, so I'm at 14. And if I increase to 15, um, no, this is too much. I won't be able to be at 15 for the last 12 hours. This is, this is too much pain. I can, I cannot afford that. So if you feel like uh, this is really increasing from 14 to 15, you have to reduce your, your pace because you want to stay at 14. So the question is, why is it uh, increasing from 14 to 15 while you are running at the same pace? Obviously, as you said, this is not a matter of uh, accumulating protons, etc. But uh, I think you, you partly answer yourself to your question is this is muscle damage. So if you have more muscle damage and of course the each step you increase slightly the muscle damage, you have inflammation. So inflammation is getting up and uh, this inflammation is perceived by the type three and four afferent fibers. Um, there is also the other uh, probably neural mechanisms uh, that uh, reduce your ability to or can I say that to automatically contract your, your muscle? So you need to, again, to improve what we call the fit forward mechanism. So you need to basically to, to, to recruit more from the motor cortex to recruit more motor units. And this is again, increasing your, your RPE. There is the digestive problems. Probably it's uh, hopefully this is not the case for you, but you may get, uh, also you may get some uh, gastrointestinal, um, distress and this is of course who's participating to the fact that yeah you're not feeling as good so again rp is the sum of everything blisters maybe you start to feel the maybe your feet start to to hurt and in the end this is all this uh, accumulating uh, nociceptive information coming from everywhere uh, explaining why if even so you you run at the same pace your rp keep keeps going up and if you want to maintain it at the same level, you have no other choice than reducing your pace. Yeah. So you can have, yeah, things like your stomach, chafing, yeah. blisters, tiredness, the exactly. increased neural like recruitment patterns, exactly. all of that, Everything. which doesn't contribute to you moving forward, 
all contributes to you slowing okay. down like like yeah. feeling it, 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 yeah your feeling it's so you're feeling uh, not as good as the beginning and if you want to maintain your IP again you have no other choice than re reducing your pace as we discussed of course at any time you can because you are not running at, at 20 obviously <laughs> you're running at uh, I don't know I, I don't even know the and I guess it's also individual but uh, let's say 12 13 out of 20 and of course you can increase you can sprint uh, anytime of the race because you are you are definitely replacing yourself but as you, you know that I'm thinking about this model and I'm thinking if I have this athlete say will is the athlete that I'm training I'm saying hey will we need you to run at this RPE because this is going to happen and you're going to get fatigued and like we know your security reserves already really small because you're really mentally tough and you've been working on your mental toughness and you're going to reduce your filling rate because you're very fit and you're going to pace appropriately at least we think right and we're, we're equipping him with those skills to pace appropriately um how how do how do we make sure that an athlete is smart enough and um composed enough to be able to listen to the feedback that they're getting from their body and be able to use this model as they're going instead of being able to look back on the model and say, hey, that that's why I totally ruined my 24-hour race <laughs> is because I overpaced in the beginning or I wasn't, uh, my, my security reserve was too high. First, I believe that uh, unlike what most people think, athletes are very smart in general. So they know which they know themselves uh, better than anybody else. So we have to trust athletes. But uh, this is true that this is difficult, and I'm not saying that uh, this uh, we should ignore all the the other possibilities to pace yourself. And particularly if you are talking about uh, 24 hours on, on a circuit that which is a, a loop, and I don't know if this is what you are going to do. Well, One's on the okay, athletics so. track. Okay, so even even better than, uh, or even worse. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> Um, then of course you can, uh, you, this is not the case if you do an ultra trail because ultra trail, it's, it's very difficult to have, uh, objective measurements, but uh, of course on the track, um, you can, you can check every 400 meters. And, uh, I'm not saying that you should completely ignore that. And, um, and I guess this is the, what you should do at the beginning, uh, make sure that you are not actually starting too fast. So the, the pacing strategy based on, on, on speed is obviously something to consider. And I'm not saying that the flush model should override everything else and everything should be based on RP. The flush model is here to explain things and, uh, I, I, it was not created to, uh, to, to, how can I say that? To control everything and, uh, uh, and, and to, to determine your, your uh, pacing strategy. You can explain the pacing strategy, it cannot uh, determine the pacing strategy. Uh, so no, I'm yeah definitely the I guess the best way is to to uh, to to do what you are to set up your initial pace based on your 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 previous training sessions and uh, heart rate is something that you can use as well. Make sure that you are uh, not starting too fast um, uh, because the the right is that uh, even so there are diverse approaches. Uh, the, the right is that uh, the, the the best runners have a, a a better pacing strategy. They they start uh, relatively slower than than the worst runners. So this is definitely uh, important. Yeah, I think that it must have been your paper that we were looking at, um, or there was an analysis of the runners in that. Uh, yeah, in you were time. you were an author on that that paper yeah. that showed something that I really laughed. I showed Matt, and I was like, yeah. "Is this not?" So typical that the fastest runners started slower relative to their overall average, and the slowest runners started fastest to their overall average. So no, you should definitely use your uh, your training background and of course your uh, the, the previous performance. Well, maybe this is your first twenty four hours run, but uh, if you have done before, you can tell. Okay, on during my training session, I was able to run that many kilometers in in six hours, for instance. And the, the year before, I was not able to do that, so maybe I can start a bit faster. So that kind of thing can de definitely help you to determine, determine your initial pace. And but at the end, I would say that uh, you do what you can. 
So <laughs> then uh, knowing the flush model uh, may be helpful. <laughs> so, uh, because, yeah, um, well, I because I'd read read your paper before um, a, a couple of weeks ago doing a a hundred k or um, but over a hundred kilometers, twelve hour training run and. What this is interesting because what I used, uh, I guess my my mental skills that I have um, and the knowledge that I gained from from your model was what I I consciously kind of did a systems check about what why do I want to slow down? I wanted to stop at I don't know nine hours, let's say eighty k's or ninety k's or whatever, um, because it was uncomfortable and everything that I, I checked my, you know, how hot was I, how uncomfortable was I, what was my mind, my stomach, my, my body, nothing particularly screamed out, you know, discomfort. You know, I had a little bit of chafing. I, my legs were sore, but not everything individually was three, you know? And so I thought at that point, well, the only reason I want to stop is because I'm soft. You know, if I stop, it's because I'm giving up. Where in actual fact, I don't want to give up. I want to be a better athlete. And so I'm going to keep running. Um, and that's where mental skills must come into it because I was catching a lot of people. It was on a loop. It was um, around six kilometers, the loop. And, and by the end, you know, and getting into the evening, I kept catching people. And as I'd catch them, they'd look at me and I could see them sort of go, oh, and it was an excuse for them to stop, to let me pass. I could, and every time, every single time, they'd stop. And I could see it in their eyes, like, oh, yes, I'm going to, this is a great excuse for me to stop. And, and I was thinking, oh, I'm not, I'm going to run even faster every time I go past someone. So there must be that mental capacity where I was talking about some people must be able to withstand that better than others at, hour 12, hour 16, where surely your motivation comes into it, even though your RP is still nowhere near maximal, right? Yes, and what, what you just said is actually very interesting. Um, so we are, so since the beginning, we were talking about mental toughness. Uh, and as I said, I believe there is a genetic component, but uh, this is definitely not all about genetics. So there is definitely an I'm sure you know that, uh, uh, ways to, to improve uh, this skill. And uh, the, the way you describe the, the fact that you check your leg, you check your stomach, et cetera, et cetera, and you were saying, okay, individually speaking, it's not too bad, uh, but this is the, the, the total of all this uh, nociceptive information that make me feeling that bad, is actually one of the mental strategy that is used in, by ultra runners. I'm, I'm, an, I'm a physiologist, so I'm def definitely not a good uh, person to, to ask uh, about the mental strategies, but uh, I've, at the end of my career, uh, I've tried to, uh, to work with, uh, with one of my friends who is actually, one of my friends who is actually a, a good uh, mental coach, and this is one of the, so, you know, the positive self-talk, uh, you know, the motor imagery, that kind of thing. And, and what you just described was actually one thing he uh, asked me to do. So making sure that uh, regularly you do, um, I don't even know the, the, the word in English, but you, you, you do a individual check. So part of the body, by part of the body, you check everything and then you rotate be between those different parts. And that helps to, sh to, that's what you described to, to say, okay, hey, in the end, I'm not that bad, so I can keep running. Yeah. Oh, that's... So, yeah. And, and uh, but I don't think people, I think people are underestimated uh, the, the importance of the, of the mental preparation. Um, yeah. If you give the choice to a runner, okay, so now you're going to, you can run for two hours or you can spend two hours uh, sitting with a mental coach and what do you prefer? Most people will choose running and because they think this is more beneficial. Uh, but uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, sometimes spending time, uh, even so this is at the expense of uh, physical training, could be a good a good strategy. Yeah, one thing you, you said to me 
uh, when I first got in contact with you about coming on the podcast was most people are going to agree that you could say something like it's 80% mental. People are like, yeah, 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 90% or whatever percentage. And generally it's really high. People will agree with that, but no one will train it. Yeah. Uh, you, you Like, and I, I never had thought about it, but like that, but yeah, there's no one that will say it's not important, but almost everyone who will not train it. So exactly. <laughs> but, but, but part of the reason probably is that uh, there are not that many people that are very skilled to train athletes. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to find good people who have those capacities. But uh, it's it's coming at least in in France in Europe and I'm sure it's the same everywhere else. Um, and I'm my prediction is that this is going to be even more important in the future. But still, physiology is the basis. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's not like we could ever overlook the importance of physiology because physiology is obviously super important. But um, I think I think you're right that mental skills coaching, like we never talked about it when I was racing. No one ever really talked about mental skills. You were either tough or you were soft and that was it. And there was nothing you could do about it. And uh, you either blew up or you didn't. You either ate or you didn't. And it was, you were either good or bad. And that, that's yeah. kind of it. But now like. I and that's why I made this, uh, this model because this is, again, this is really to, to try to integrate everything. Yeah, exactly. And we're only just now, like as sports people and as scientists even, like just starting to use even power meters everywhere. You know, like in the Tour de France, yep, everyone has a power meter. Mountain Bike World Cup, most people have a power meter. You know, Downhill World Cup, which is maybe mostly mental. No one has a power meter. No one knows how hard they're pedaling, anything like that. Um, and, but as you say, people are starting to adopt more of the mental skills training. So, yep, we're starting to adopt this technology to use in our training. We can start to adopt the the help of mental skills coaches, and eventually we'll have this whole system approach to athletic performance that I don't think is totally there yet, especially uh, in in the age group ranks and even at the professional level. Your model can start to become like an integral part where you, it's it's very visual, so you can see like what what's the filling rate, what's contributing to your filling rate. Like now. Um, I work with a lot of athletes and I'm super um, on them, like uh, encouraging them to get running power meters. You know, so we, we're getting that, that next level of information, which is super important to accompany heart rate and things. And cyclists have had it for, for years now, decades even. And that's really, you can really get a good grasp of what your filling rate is kind of physiologically outside of, you know, blisters or discomfort or, you know, whatever. And then I guess now we're getting to the point where what's your water level when you're starting? How do we, how do we minimize that? Cause no one like Matt, how often do you talk to athletes and discuss how mentally relaxed they are and how their relationships going and how their, how their week at work went? Yeah. It's kind of a no go zone sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So what, Guy, what would be your, like your, your takeaways or like your practical tips for someone listening to this and they go, all right, okay, I never even considered that mental, the mental component of things was, was so important. You know, Matt and I talk a lot about pacing, uh, a lot, (laughs) a lot about, uh, thresholds, training zones, you know, all of this science that can help us perform optimally and, manage our resources all the way through from, you know, two minutes to, to 24 hours. But in terms of like these mental skills or components, like what, what are your recommendations? Well, as I said, I don't think I'm the best person to <laughs> ask for that kind of thing. I'm an exercise physiologist. Uh, I was only talking about that because I, I felt that, uh, and I still feel of course that that was important. That is important. And we need to, we need to consider those things. And, uh, that's what I did probably too late, uh, during my, uh, running career. Um, but no, there are, there are definitely, uh, ways to, to improve your, your mental skills. Uh, and uh, the science is actually uh, here to show that to a given extent. There are 
probably there is probably more um, to, to do on, on that field, but uh, I think the evidence is already there. Um, so yeah, talk to a, to a specialist uh, and, and accept to spend time on that. Um, and generally speaking, I would say that every time you go for a training, ask yourself why you are doing that. Uh, is it just because, yeah, you feel like uh, I, I need to run, so I go for a run, but uh, sometimes you go for a run and you don't even know why, why you do that. So try to think about, uh, uh, not to overthink, but to, to think about your, 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 your training. Try to not uh, uh, neglect any, any part of the, of the performance. So again, the, the flush model and the, the other papers that we have uh, published on the, the determining factors of performance uh, are, I, I hope, helpful to, to show the, the different aspects. And this is, this is the beauty of this sport, I guess, is that this is, this is virtually very complicated. So we are talking about pacing, we have talked about uh, physiology, and of course we could have talked about that in, in, in much more detail. So I talk about, we have talked about the psychological aspect, we didn't talk about the logistic, but this is another important uh, thing. Uh, the, the equipment, obviously, uh, the, the economy, the etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are so many aspects that you really have to, to take care of uh, every single detail if you want to improve performance. But the, to go back to your question, the, the mental, is definitely one of those and one very important one that people tend to uh, underestimate, in my opinion. That's awesome. I th that'll uh, definitely give us and our listeners plenty to, to think about uh, coming up with, uh, in New Zealand anyway, uh, with coming into summer. So the race season is upon us. Um, so that's that's super awesome. If uh, listeners want to get more, um, some of your papers, your research or more of your work as do you have a website or anywhere um, people can go i have a, actually a very recent website so this is a good timing <laughs> uh, it's uh, www.kinesiology like kinesiology but with g g u i dot com and, oh, uh, awesome. kinesi at, yeah at kinesiology on twitter huh. That's cool. All right. Well, I'll put that in the show notes and, and share it out and I'll tag you and stuff. Uh, so when we put this out there, yeah, so but on, on the website, heaps. it's not, it's sorry. It's, uh, just to, to make sure that people are aware that it's not all about, uh, ultra endurance on, on the website. It's really more about fatigue because, uh, uh, yeah, fatigue is definitely my thing. Uh, but uh, the, there is actually, uh, also a lot on the clinical side. So, uh, but hopefully, uh, runners and actually ultra endurance athletes will find interesting stuff. Uh, it, mo part of it is in French, but most of it is in English. So, um, yeah, I hope they enjoy it. Great. Cool. Thanks for coming on the show, Guy. Thank you for again for inviting me. Uh, have a great day. Bye bye. All right, well, um, that was a super awesome discussion with Key. Um, that stuff's really cool, and I guess he kind of made me think a little bit more about the mental toughness. Um, I know, I, man, because you just wrote it off. Yeah, before. Yeah. <laughs> I think when he... Like, I have been convincing you, and yeah. Jay Barrett, who's been on the show a couple of times, like, who I work with, you know, he's convinced you a bit, but I think that was... You know, that would kind bit. of put me over the edge. The combined, like, physiology and psychology... That one yeah. got me. So yeah. that was good. Yeah. That was and good. he's got, you know, as he said, over 200 published articles. And so you're like, all right, all right. Yeah. Like, all right, tell me. Go on. Tell me. Yeah, it was good. I, I couldn't argue. Right, so, yeah, that was that was really cool. And I think our, our listeners are going to take a lot from that because it is the combined integrative approach to performance, which is really cool. And that's what our listeners are into. Yeah. And I'd love how an expert like that, who is a professor at a university, still is willing to admit, sorry, I don't know. Yeah. You know, like he said that a couple of times. I'm not sure. And he's just, because he knows what he knows and he's comfortable admitting he doesn't know something. And I think that's, that's super amazing. That will do us for another show. But before we go. Yeah. Before we go, we got to tell about our new website that just launched. 
So performanceadvantagepodcast.com. I was working on that all weekend. Will made some tweaks and we launched it. It's good to go. And we have two new courses that are available for pre-order now. That's right. I am putting together the running power or running with the power meter, power meter running, running in the 21st century. It's a working title, I guess. <laughs> the new science of running. Uh, we're putting it together in a digestible format. We got some amazing feedback from our endurance or not endurance training, just pretty much application of sports science masterclass, which is a six part module. I mean, there was a lot. There's a lot to digest there. Uh, and we got some great feedback. So we're taking that feedback, applying it to a smaller three part modulized course with myself doing the the running power and matt doing mountain bike power yeah and they are totally separate so you don't have to be a runner slash mountain biker to be able to enjoy one course there are two separate courses a lot of it's really complementary because we're going to talk about actually what is power and those things really cross over very nicely in the mountain bike course we're going to talk only about mountain biking and the running course we're going to talk about only about running so it's going to be really cool and you can pre-order those now and they launch on january 1st yeah, use the code POWER30 to get 30 bucks off the pre-register price. That's performanceadvantagepodcast.com. We've also got articles, blogs, transcripts. We're going next level with this with yeah, this podcast. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's check great. All right, guys. If you want to get more from Guy, make sure you check out the, the show notes and the website. Till next time, guys. Catch you later. See ya. See ya.